Hello and welcome to this edition of The Print Review, a webinar series about 3D printing brought to you by PLM Group. The topic of this show is supply chain and how 3D printing can be used to overcome some of the major challenges in this area. With us here today, we have Thomas Lundstrom. He's head of 3D at the Nordic logistics company Post Nord. Hi, Thomas, and uh, welcome to The Print Review. Hello, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming. Now, um, Thomas, um, supply chain is riddled with challenges, right? Um, you've got costly warehousing, complex logistics, um, sustainability issues, lead times, uh, local and, and of course, remote manufacturing issues. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this uh, as you've been researching uh, the use of 3D printing. Uh, definitely. I mean, uh, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities and benefits uh, regarding it as well. So, yeah, so it's great. Yeah. I mean, you've been active in 3D printing now for several years, exploring different technologies, etc. Um, and of course, you've, you've built your own uh, workflow, which you'll show us in your presentation here today. But can you already now provide some key takeaways from uh, your research? Yeah, of course. I mean, the first thing we notice is that the interest around 3D printing is huge. Uh, the curiosity and willingness to learn is actually very, very uh, huge. Um, but one of the greatest challenges that we see and also that we meet every day is the change in mindset around the fundamentals of supply chain. And this is something that is really hard to comprehend at the moment. Um, but that would be one of our greatest challenges uh, to, to uh, change how we see the supply chain. Uh, and the third would be that there's so much benefit when it comes to 3D printing technology that is still untapped and that needs to be explored and understand more widely. So those are kind of our key takeaways. It's kind of a high level for this um, this webinar. And uh, I think we will go in, in more depth in, in future webinars about how to explain all these things. But today we'll show you a little bit more overhead. Excellent, I can't wait. So, um, you know, without further ado, please take it away, Thomas. Uh, show us your presentation. Thank you very much. So let's get started. And I just want you to confirm that you can see my monitor here now in, in just a second. Yes, it's all there, nice then, and dandy. Then let's go. Okay, so Postnode Treaty Solutions, what is it and why do we do it and uh, how do we do it? So to start off that, uh, just give you a brief explanation. We started this about three years ago uh, to understand the, the implications on supply chain. And uh, just to make something, um, just explain a little bit more. I'm just gonna see changes. The post uh, offering today is, is really wide. We have a lot of different uh, areas within our business. And uh, when we start adding these up, we start realizing that we control a lot of the supply chain already for our customers today. Uh, we have printing and manufacturing facilities. We have logistics facilities, of course, distribution hubs. Uh, we have third party logistics where we handle warehousing and on demand deliveries for our customers. And when we start gathering these ones, uh, we of course see that we handle a lot of the supply chain already, which makes it that 3D printing has a fit into our current business model. Um, if we look at how the world is changing, we talk about the digitalization, a global market and automation with disruptive technologies. Uh, then we see that 3D printing is a disruptive technology. We can actually see that it has implications on, on several different business areas. One of them, of course, is logistics and warehousing, where we reduce transportation, we reduce warehousing, um, but also in the manufacturing where where they become more digital, where they need to be able to have a distributed manufacturing. Um, if we look at it to the more uh, futuristic point of view, we will see that a more sustainable society is actually in, within our grasp with these kinds of technology. 3D printing is, of course, not the, the sole uh, dominator of uh, sustainability societies, but it will be a driving factor and one of the pieces of the puzzle to actually create a sustainable society. Uh, and also with it, we bring a lot of new innovation and new um, uh, rethinking of how we are actually creating products. Um, and that's a very interesting point to see when you look at 3D printing, how it removes a lot of the obstacles that have been there for many, many, many years. 
Um, and, and this is one of the biggest changes in the manufacturing industry. Um, so, so there are a lot of different ways to look at 3D printing more than just out of a logistics perspective. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, what we've seen uh, over the years, of course, is that 3D printing um, has first and foremost been used as a prototyping tool. But what you're saying is that will change in the future and 3D printing will become more of a viable um, real manufacturing technology, right? Yeah, exactly. And we're already seeing it today. I mean, I will show some, some examples today, but uh, just take some out of the blue. You have car manufacturers today using uh, 3D printing to create end parts. You have um, <clears throat> bigger companies like GE who creates, uh, you know, prints um, airplane parts. So we're already seeing that we are adopting the technology into production. Um, so I'm pretty sure, I, I'm very confident that uh, we'll see more about that uh, in, in the near future, actually. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, I mean, uh, just to show you a quick video uh, with uh, HP 3D printer, just a time lapse showing you how it works when the printer is running. And it's quite interesting to see the different types of technology. We have a few of them, but I think the HP technology now is, is very much interesting because when you look at this video you actually see that it prints a full print bed in one stroke and you compare that to other technologies who actually just print uh, one layer that is basically uh, drawn by a printer head or or let's say that it's, it's injected on a, on a specific place on the printer uh, we already see that you know productiveness you know the effectiveness of production is coming with the hp printer and, and uh, similar technologies uh, it's quite interesting to see that uh, this technology is happening right now. Production speed is, of course, very important uh, if you are ever to use 3D printing as a manufacturing technology, right? Definitely. I mean, today I would say that there is no printer that meets the need of our customers in terms of speed when it comes to you know, comparing uh, one day delivery from a warehouse. Uh, but you know, it will come there. We are seeing this. I mean, the HP printer actually was, I don't know, 50 times faster than this, its uh, predecessor technology. And, and this kind of shows that in, in the coming years, I think we will see uh, like huge increase of fast printers. Um, but we don't, uh, we need to be careful that we don't lack the quality because when you ramp up the speed, uh, you know, there's a cost of something else. So I hope the machine manufacturers can manage this in, in a really good way. Let's, uh, we move on to the supply chain. And uh, th this is an image that many, many customers recognize and, and, and many consumers understand. Uh, you have a supplier network and you have a centralized manufacturing site, most of them in Asia, but they're of course in Europe and USA as well, and other parts of the uh, world. Uh, but what's in important here is to look at how many transportations there are. And, this is just a, a scaled image. I mean, if you go to the right side of the image, you see the warehousing, the local warehousing, but then you have, you know, uh, local warehouse for Europe, then you have a local warehouse from Sweden. So you have a distributed warehousing effect uh, where you have to have different spare parts in different areas of the world. Uh, and this creates a lot of, you know, overproduction and a lot of transportation unnecessarily because most of these parts in the warehouse are actually just there to guarantee that the product is working. But not all of them will be used, and I think majority of them is actually not used, um, and they will have to you know, uh, remove them from the warehouse in a few years to create a place for the new parts. But then we also can't forget that in the central manufacturing site, there are warehousing for keeping the injection mold tools. So you have a lot of warehousing going on for one part. Even if the part only has, let's say, you know, 1,000 in quantity or 10,000 in quantity, there is this big supply chain for every part. And this is what people tend to forget. What we're seeing and what we hope that it will be changing is to more of a digital supply chain. Uh, and this is a part of the supply chain 4.0 where you talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, just in time, like we've been talking about forever, just in time manufacturing. But this can happen in, in reality with the help of 3D printing. So let's say that the manufacturers now become this uh, digital manufacturers and send the data uh, to our 
local distributed manufacturing sites around the world um, where we can actually produce as close as possible to the customer, then we can reduce a lot of these warehousing, a lot of the uh, transportation. And if you, if you take a moment to look at these pictures, you would see that the amount of trucks, I mean, we don't even have airplanes going in this first picture. And you look at the other one, we have reduced the amount of trucks very much, um, just so that we can have a more local and, and, and more sustainable su supply chain, I would say. Um, and it's quite interesting to look at it in this way. What do you think, Matthias? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it has so many positive uh, uh, implications uh, um, that are not currently in your picture. Um, you know, um, the amount of gas yeah. used, the uh, number of, you know, trucks on the roads, uh, etc. Of course. And, and if we look at it, our, our out of the perspective of PostNord, uh, we have a lot of distribution facilities today. And our goal is, of course, to be as close as possible to the customers, the end customers. And this is just a graphic showing, you know, the possibilities of uh, how it could look in the future with the distributed manufacturing sites. The orange dot is where we actually started right now to create a center point of the whole Nordic region. Uh, PostNord is a Nordic, country, uh, Nordic company, so we work uh, with our Nordic strategy, of course. Uh, so that's why we don't have all the other countries with us. But the, the main point is to start in Stockholm to create uh, a center of Nordic and then try to distribute this to the other countries, uh, capital cities maybe, or even uh, a better, when we have more data, the best location as possible, of course, to be as close as, as possible to our end customers. And with, with this, we are hoping that, you know, you see this big shirt picture and it's fading away uh, into just a text here. Um, and it's, it's because, you know, big warehousing, I, I hope it will not be the same. I, I believe it will not be the same as it is today. I, I think we will see a lot of more hybrid centers. This is our study as well, to, to get hybrid centers for warehouses where we actually have both uh, uh, stock management and, and print production in the same facility so that maybe we can keep the critical stock for our customers down to, let's say, uh, in a few parts instead of a few hundred parts. Uh, so that the customers, maybe we have one on shelf, and then when we send that, we automatically print another one and put one there instead of 100. So I think this is a, a good idea to understand that how you could change it. But it's still, like I said, in the early stages of our introduction, it's a change in the fundamentals of supply chain. This will not happen overnight. It will take a while, a long time, I would say, a uh, few years, even more, before customers actually start realizing the benefits. But to make this possible, you need to have tools to make it possible. So we actually created a, a on-demand portal for uh, 3D printing, um, which few of our customers are already using. Um, but this is a full automation port portal where you can log in and you can upload your 3D data and you can save your digital warehouse uh, on, our, uh, on our hosting. And, and all this happens live. You have live pricing, so you will actually see how much your part costs uh, and how much you want to order the lead times, etc. So we're trying really hard to make this digital effort in, in a true on-demand 24-7 delivery automation. Um, because we see that if we're talking about uh, shortening lead times and you know a more sustainable society, we cannot have quotation uh, tools for uh, wait for our customers to wait several days. That that removes the time aspect. And if we remove the time aspect out of 3D printing, then then we could rather use the traditional manufacturing and and uh, still have the same issues. So exactly. for us, it's very very yeah. So very important here. Sorry, okay. Matthias. Yeah, so you, what you're saying is that uh, each link in your process needs to be aligned, um, you know, so there are no time losses, you know, across the full, you know, production chain, as it were. Exactly, exactly. And it, it's, uh, it's critical for a 3D print success, I would say. Uh, otherwise, it's just another manufacturing tool that takes uh, equally long because of administrative processes. Yeah. And, and we, we chose to have this portal free to use because also uh, one of our points of our study is to make it more available for 3D printing. And if we do, then start, uh, you know, uh, um, get our customers to pay for an on-demand service, then it's 
not really an on-demand service. I would say it's a licensed tool. So we we have it free to use. Uh, you pay as you order, basically, uh, and uh, everyone is welcome to use it if they are, are a company. We don't have a customer po a consumer portal today. Um, this is hosted with our partner CD On. Actually, if you go to their website, there is a 3D print uh, function now, and it's uh, in collaboration with us for consumers, private private consumers. Yeah, and then anyone that doesn't know what CD On is, it's a um, it's basically a an online uh, web shop, right? Uh, for yeah, print. it's an it's an e-commerce platform for several different uh, stores or or yeah. Handle. Uh, let's move on to some of our uh, cases that we work with and uh, one of the most famous one is SG, uh, the Swedish railroad company and uh, what we did there is kind of a trivial thing and this is also something that we, we touched on a lot of in our communication that many of the cases that are displayed in 3D printing are these awesome things, they are cool, they are you know exciting, it's the heart, it's the airplane, it's a rocket, it's a Tesla car, whatever, like the cool stuff. Uh, we tend to like get caught in that moment and say, wow, that's 3D printing, we can't do anything else. But with, with the Swedish Railroad Company, we actually did a toilet roll holder, which kind of amazed a lot of people. Why would you do a toilet roll holder? For uh, They would cost like 10 kroners at Ikea or something. But the problem with trains are that they are special designs. So these toilet roll holders are actually very expensive and hard to come by. Um, and they had an issue where the actual part broke. So together with SJ, we, we actually basically redesigned the whole thing. Uh, it might sound silly, but they actually had a cost reduction of 65% almost, uh, and they don't need a warehousing. So if you just uh, reduce the cost on the actual procurement, and we haven't calculated the, the warehousing cost or, or the you know downtime maintenance of the toilets, but we actually, solve the problem with creating an, an inward geometry that uh, was hard for uh, injection molding to do. So it's kind of like an in, inside lock on the, uh, the, the toy roll holder. Uh, and it, it's right. those kind of trivial things that kind of makes it uh, more touch in reality, I would say. Yeah, so, so uh, these design services is also something that you offer. Uh... Yeah, in, in what? Uh, in in uh, oh no something happened in in uh, yeah I would say in, in more of a 3D optimization we do not offer like uh, engineering of new products um, we offer more of a like a design for 3D um, consultation or support so we can actually do some kind of drawing for customers when it comes to 3D printing um, so I would think that this you need, still need to defer those differentiate those two things you know engineering a new product requires a lot of work but re redesigning something for a 3d print is um, I would say a little bit easier um, work to be done right yeah so let's move on and uh, fixtures are a big thing with 3d printing so in our third-party logistics we use 3d printing to create fixtures for device testing when customers send back their router or something to our customer it's our third-party logistics center that handle it so they they receive it back and then uh, create the, they do the test to see if it's working and then repack it and a new customer gets, gets it uh, so we created this black box which is a cable fixture so that the, the personnel in our warehouses don't have to connect all the cables manually. They just have to push it in basically. And this creates a more flexible workflow and, and work uh, environment, uh, ergonomical work environment. And, and these are some of the, the, the benefits with 3D printing. It's not expensive to create these things. It's actually very cheap and very easy, but it has a high uh, uh, benefit on efficiency. So I think more customers or more the companies should actually look to this when it comes to uh, work environment. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, we don't just help our customers, we help ourselves uh, in, in our productions. We have so many machines and so many spare parts, it's unbelievable. Um, so what we're doing, we have an internal project looking over uh, spare parts that can be 3D printed, and we have this very good example of a part that is aluminum, like CNC aluminum, um, which is very expensive. It costs uh, almost 1,000 Swedish kroners. 
And the problem is that it bends because it's aluminum, very, very weak, and it bends all the time. So our technicians need to remove it from the machine and bend it back and then put it back in the machine. So we get a downtime. And we printed it in, in, in carbon fiber uh, and nylon, uh, two materials in the same. Uh, and actually, we reduced the cost by 67%. Again, this is only on procurement, uh, not on calculating uptime of the machine or reducing of uh, uh, stock management. So, uh, and we also reduced the lead time to less than a month, uh, more than a month, I mean, and, and uh, we have it in a day, of course. And we don't need to have the warehouse. So if we start calculating all those things, I mean, the reduced price is, of course, a lot more than 67% because the downtime of a machine, it's about 30,000 envelope an hour, uh, and that's a lot of money. So, yeah. Um, and and yeah. What, what about the what about the performance of the part? You're saying the original part was um, traditionally manufactured in aluminum. No, you said uh, what yeah. was the metal? Yeah, aluminum. Uh, and, and you, you uh, switched to what carbon fiber? Uh, nylon, N nylon and carbon fiber. Yeah, right. what, two materials. Uh, and we haven't actually be able to measure it because it's still not broken. It's been there for one year now. Uh, before that, we actually had the technicians once in a month to remove these and, and bend them. So I think that's a quite increase of a longer lifetime. So we're still yes. calculating it. Uh, oh, yeah, it's our opinion. Okay, um, moving on. We have more parts in our production that we actually use and have designed some of them ourselves and uh, have uh, done some rework on some of the parts. And these are actually wear and tear parts that you see here uh, that have been so expensive for our machines that it's kind of ridiculous when you hear our technician team come to us and say, this is something that we need to fix. Um, so, so what we've done is that we, we looked at all the parts that they bring and then we do an analysis, is it worth it to continue or is it not worth to continue? And one of these parts are actually very much interesting and it's the part to the left this cone-like picture that you see. And, uh, and this actually breaks and it, we, we tested a lot of different materials and we were thinking, okay, maybe we should print this in, in metal because you know, there's, there's a machine that pushes this in and, and if someone makes a mistake, then this thing breaks and it's kind of a protection for the blue bar behind it. Uh, and we, we started realizing that it does not matter what type of material, if we don't print it in titanium and that would be very expensive, it would break anyway. So we, we, we reduced it to like the cheapest material that we had and reduced the cost by 95% instead of, uh, you know, having a high cost part uh, that will break no matter what, when the accident happens. And it's, it's quite interesting, you know, when you start asking the question, why does it break? Why do we need it? And why is it there basically? Uh, then you start realizing that, oh, wow, we can actually make changes that we did not believe were possible because no one told us or we didn't think about it. So I think the best question to ask at the start of 3D printing is why is this part built as it's built? Because most of the parts are built from traditional point of view. So you choose the material, you choose the certification and that's it basically. You don't really uh, care so much about it. But here you have the freedom to actually change whatever it is that you want to change. And if we're moving on, you know, looking at uh, other types of uh, businesses, I would say that they are quite interesting when you talk about 3D printing, because we are uh, looking a lot of uh, at spare parts, of course, that's the main thing that we're looking at, spare parts and logistics, you know, how can we handle this? But at the same time, you know, when you have a printer that can print multiple parts at the same time to different segments, so why wouldn't you open up your business for for a more widespread segment. So we started working with the uh, hospitals and I'm just gonna show you a short video here. And when you see that video, you start realizing that, wow, we printed actually one-to-one -one slices of human parts uh, and not to be uh, implemented like an implant in the body of the, the patient, but more that 
the, the doctors today, they want to practice on the operation, the surgery that they are going to do. So what we can actually do is that we can take an X-ray image and convert it to 3D uh, data, and then we print it. So it's actually a one-to-one -one on a patient. So you see a foot, you see a heart on the pictures that I show you, you see a cranium, you see a spine, uh, you see a pelvis. Uh, all these things are one-to-one -one scale so that the, the doctors can um, practice on the surgery that they are going to perform before they even going to perform it. And this, this is something that really can help the, the medical care of our patients and our doctors. They will save time, they will save cost by not having to uh, be inside the surgery room, uh, which is very expensive. But also the time that the patients are, you know, visiting the hospitals. Uh, we had uh, Liana, who is on the picture here. Um, she was speaking on one of our events last year about uh, how they could uh, reduce uh, a surgery of a patient down to one surgery instead of three because they knew the defects that would happen and they knew how to create how to make the surgery and this is quite interesting because it's not really aligned with our main strategy to work with the you know supply chain but like i said why not open it up because it's the same printers we can print it at the same time as we're printing let's say a car spare part or a machine spare part and this is the beauty with 3d printing you know uh, we don't have to limit the technology down to just one side of a segment. We don't have to limit one business model down to just one uh, uh, one um, production line because it's the same machines. And it's, it's kind of hard to comprehend when you don't work within 3D printing that, okay, can you print a foot at the same time you print a, uh, let's say, a, a machine spare part? Yes, you can. In the same time, yes, you can in the same machine at, at the exactly same thing. Yes, you can. You can put it next to each other and print them at the same time. It's, it's not going to raise the cost on e one of the either. It's going to have the same impact. And I think this is, this is really the true beauty about 3D printing. We don't have the limitation that we need to have an injection tool that only produces one type of part at one time. We could actually create, you know, let's say we, we fill our HP machine with 1,000 products. It can be 1,000 different products in the same uh, run batch. And yeah. this is the beauty of 3D printing. Yeah. So, so do you think, I can imagine, um, you know, with you working so wide and then, you know, moving from, from train operators to um, hospitals, that'll give you some, some really nice experiences that you can, you know, bring back and implement into your organization, right? Definitely, definitely. And it's, we start realizing that, you know, uh, creating these types of supply chains for different segments starting to align with each other with the help of 3D printing. It becomes more of a natural structure rather than, you know, you have to have this and you have to have that for the different supply chains. And, and I think this will help a lot of companies and, and uh, a lot of business segments to uh, accelerate their business. And I mean, hospitals are not a business in, in per se but they are a segment where you need to have these tools, you need to have these uh, equipment that, that are needed. Of course, then, then, the, then you still have the med tech certified area, which is still needed because, you know, implants in, in bodies, et cetera, that needs to be very high uh, quality controlled, very, very high precision, et cetera. And it's, that's quite hard with 3D printing today. There are some that print, you know, implants in titanium, um, but it's, it's, it's very hard. And I think we, we will not work with those kind of things. We work with the more easier stuff, but to create the more um, easier flow in the, the order management for these companies. Yeah. So, so Liana here, she actually uses our platform in her uh, cell phone. So sometimes she plays an order when she's running back and forth between the X-ray machines. She's a radiologist on, on Karolinska University Hospital. So, uh, it's quite funny how she saves a lot of time yes, by using our service. That's a fantastic case. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So that's basically what I have for, for us today. Um, we're seeing the time running out, which is great. I had a lot of fun doing this. And I, I hope that uh, uh, you, Matthias, also had a lot of fun and that our uh, attendees uh, have, have thought this was an, a good experience. Yes, it was very enlightening, and, and we look forward to learning more about 3D printing and, and how you can use 3D printing uh, to tackle some of the challenges in, in supply chain. So uh, 
I hope you all will uh, stay tuned and uh, thank you very much for attending this edition of, of the print interview. And thank you very much, Thomas, for coming. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about your work in upcoming webinars, of course. And uh, that's it from us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.